Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. All right, we're going to stay with the equity uh, universe, Tim, and one stock in particular that's down about 2.2% as we speak. Yeah, that, of course, is shares of the Walt Disney Company down yeah, 2.2%, uh, thanks to a showdown between the company and its CEO, Bob Iger, and activist investor Nelson Peltz and his try on fund management. The showdown came down to shareholders declaring the winner. That winner, Disney and CEO. Bob Iger. Yeah, and they had the backing of big institutional investors that hold a big chunk of Disney shares. We're talking about Vanguard and BlackRock, BlackRock excuse me, who own about 15% of Disney shares. All right, with more on that outcome and what we need to know about Disney, what it really kind of needs to do to get back on track. Back with us is Bloomberg Intelligence Technology Media Analyst Geetha Ranganathan uh, from RBI headquarters in Princeton, New Jersey. All right, Geetha. <laughs> She's been busy today. <laughs> Votes over. What's the impact of the vote and the outcome on what Disney does next or maybe what you think it should do next? I think this is definitely, I think, a a personal win for Bob Iger, who has spent so much time over the past few months kind of canvassing for support. I mean, rallying all the investors. Remember, Disney has a huge, huge retail investor base. Almost 40% of its shareholders are retail investors. And he has spent a lot of resources, more than $40 million, kind of trying to get their support. So I think this is just, you know, a a, a job well done for him and a huge sigh of relief. But in terms of what the company is doing, I don't really necessarily think that this shareholder vote outcome has any impact at all on near-term trends. Hmm. Bob Iger has already kind of taken control of the narrative. He's gotten uh, a lot of things moving in terms of, you know, content cost cuts, uh, cost cuts actually across the board. There's just rationalization of output. There's investments in new growth areas, including, you know, gaming. We saw that 1.5 billion investment in Epic Games. So he is doing everything to ride the ship. There's obviously a new digital strategy for ESPN in place. Um, So I think we're just going to continue to see, uh, you know, management do more of the same. I think the one thing that's going to be a little bit different, Carol, is there's going to be intense scrutiny on this board to really come up with a good succession plan. I think that is one thing that, you know, most of these activist investors kind of kept pounding the table and kept saying, you know, you guys really botched succession and please don't bungle it this time around. So was it, wait, so, oh, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead no, go ahead, Carol. Well, so was it, do they not like that I, Bob Iger came back? Is that the problem that they say that when Bob Iger left the first time that that was the succession planning that didn't, it wasn't was it in place or what? He, he, Yeah, it was not so much Bob Iger coming back, but him kind of suggesting Bob Chapek and maybe the board didn't Uh, push back enough. Got it. Right. Because he didn't. Yes, he was a parks executive, but did he have all the experience needed for running kind of the content engine? Clearly, he didn't. And that's where a lot of the missteps kind of surfaced. Right. And so, you know, there's been this constant uh, complaint about, you know, did the board really do their job or were they just so enthralled and so enamored by Iger that they just took mm-hmm. his word at face value? Yeah, that's uh, what we heard yesterday from um, Comptroller Brad Lander in his comments to Scarlett uh, during our, that interview late yesterday about uh, this ahead of the vote. Um, so what about some names here, Geetha, that could be floated if we're talking succession at Disney now that this proxy battle is behind Bob Iger? Um, what are some names we should keep an eye on? Who's being floated around? So at Disney, Tim, it's typically been an internal candidate. Uh, I mean, if you go back many, many years, I mean, you know, up until 1984, it's always kind of been an internal candidate. And so I think that's what's going to happen this time around as well. Obviously, the four big division chiefs are in play here. We're talking about Dana Walden, who heads TV. We're talking about Josh DeMauro, who heads Parks. There's Jimmy Pitaro for ESPN. And then there's Alan Bergman from the film uh, and and the studio uh, segment. The problem with Disney is it's just such a diverse conglomerate, right? It's this behemoth. And, you know, Josh Tomorrow having vast experience in parks isn't really going to help because he has absolutely zero experience in running a TV network or in running a streaming service or even like, you know, coming up with green lighting a film. So that really is a problem. And, you know, it, that has kind of always been the persistent problem with, with Disney because you have these executives who are so good in one specific area, but who have absolutely no exposure in the other. And so it's going to be a, a really challenging, uh, you know, obviously yeah. Bob Iger's shoes are very big to fill. 
So the, the idea is that they're probably going to have somebody come in as a COO um, to yeah. kind of get that experience in Got all it. the different segments. Got it. We're going all in on Disney during the first part of this hour today, from how the company prevailed to what it means now that it's triumphed over Pelts. First key to Disney's win was the backing of the company's two largest shareholders, none other than Vanguard Group and BlackRock. Together, they control about 15% of Disney's stock. Crystal C. is Bloomberg News Deals reporter. She wrote about how each side campaigned ahead of the vote and the importance of the institutional backers. She's here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio. So we talked about... um, I mentioned Vanguard and BlackRock, but talk about how they came out in support of Iger ahead of this. Yeah, so uh, we reported that Vanguard, the largest institutional shareholder with uh, almost 8% share, was supporting uh, the company, the management, yesterday. So it's actually pretty unusual for an institutional shareholder to not support management. So that was um, that was interesting. But actually what's missing here is that the biggest uh, voting block here is actually retail investors. Over 30%, actually almost 40% of Disney stocks are owned by retail. And you know, a lot of kids, when they're born, they get a share of Disney right. as a present. And a lot of these are Disney fans, and they tend to side with management. Actually, in any given proxy fight, over 80%. So the retail also sides with management. So so any given proxy by 80% of retail investors that vote would side with management. That's not, just typical. It is a typical scenario. Not all of them vote. It is incredibly hard to get retail investors to actually cast their vote because a lot of them are not used to this proxy process. Huh. But this actually had happened this time as well. Like We've seen the show up from retail and those are also siding with management. And that's why we see today's result that Iger and all uh, Disney nominees have been reelected into have been elected into the board. It just feels like you know, Tim. It was kind of a torturous, long, costly fight for Disney. We know that they've been you know going after this, and then when all is said and done, you know they're still in place. But they obviously, as we heard from, we talked with Geetha Ranganathan of our Bloomberg Intelligence team, that they've still got to make some changes, especially when it comes to succession. Yeah, I want to get to those changes in just a minute. But think but about I, it. Differently. But but I still want to stick on the voting side of things, even okay. though even though this is you know Bloomberg reported this yesterday. I still think this is fascinating, Crystal. Um, because there were also some companies and, uh, and individuals who came out, in uh, prominent individuals, prominent board members who came out in support of Nelson Peltz. It's like being picked for, you know, a volley- not a volleyball game or something. Dodgeball. Or dodgeball, yeah, right? When you're in, like, <laughs> like, junior high or who something. Who gets, who gets, who gets. <laughs> Yeah, there is a lot of, you know, oh, we are endorsing Nelson versus we're in, we're siding with, with Iger. Um, so there are institutional, institutional shareholders that voted with Peltz. Uh, Newberger Berman actually said in a statement that they would uh, vote for Peltz, and they did. And um, again, because so much of this is owned by retail shareholders. Right. And there's actually no one single institutional shareholders that had over 10% share. So mm. even if you get all the index, all the passive investors to vote for you, you're still, you really still need to count on the retail investors. And that's what Disney is doing really well in this proxy fight where they have gone all out in the social media campaign. And you go on Spotify, you go on Instagram, you're getting all these ads of a friendly Disney voice telling you to fight for the white proxy card. And that had actually successfully pulled some of that votes for them. Well, nothing like a media company knowing how to market itself, right? Exactly. I mean, I heard some of those ads yeah. like ahead of podcasts. I was like, why are we hearing these ads? Yeah, that is kind of weird. I mean, is that unusual for a company to be that aggressive? It's almost like, you know, before the Oscars, right? When the movies go out. For your consideration for Bob Iger. Exactly. But is it unusual to kind of reach out in that way? It is unusual because this is actually the most expensive proxy fight that we have we've seen. Um, the data is uh, showing that Disney actually had said they spent over, they, they budgeted $40 bil- a million dollars yeah. on this proxy fight. And that goes to things like social media posts, that goes to um, mailing, traditional mailing uh, to their shareholder list. And those things are expensive. And it, now that they've won, that is finally going to be set aside, you know, and you can focus on running the company again. But it's time consuming and very costly. Okay, so speaking of that, I, I want to bring in Jamie Lumley, senior analyst at Third Bridge Group, joining us from New York City. Um, so Iger's won the battle, Jamie. Now he's got to fight the war. As we just heard from Crystal, the pressure is still on. What is at the top of the agenda for him to do now that he's won the proxy vote? 
Well, the pressure is definitely still on and it's hard to think of just one thing at the top of the agenda because it's so long. But if you had to pinpoint one thing that I think investors will really be looking at is streaming profitability. The company's planning on finally driving profits in fiscal year 2024. This is coming after so many quarters and years of billions in losses in this segment. And we've heard Bob Iger talk about how important the streaming transition is for the business, really making sure that they're hitting their mark and achieving their goals. That's definitely priority number one as they move beyond this proxy fight. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, Timmy, we're talking kind of in the newsroom. It's like they won the battle, but have they won the war, right? They still have to make some changes. I mean, at the core of what Disney is, it's a lot of moving parts and some are much more significant. I, I find it wild to see that we are looking at a Disney today that when you talk about what really moves the profit needle, it's really parks at this point. Parks are definitely huge. And if we think back to one of the big news stories at the end of 23 was the fact that Disney is doubling its capital expenditures and its parks and experiences business over the next decade. And $60 billion is substantial. And it really shows the realization at Disney that while, of course, it is a priority to build out streaming to make sure that they have a transition away from the linear assets, which have historically been a big profit driver, parks have been consistent coming out of the pandemic. Domestically, it's been a strong profit driver. International has served seeing the year-on-year -year improvement in those markets. It's definitely a top priority. And one big question also that investors have is where this new capital investment is going to go because to date, and you could hear this on the shareholder meeting today, Disney is not really given, they haven't shown their hand as to where these dollars are going to go. There are some large projects, but there's still some uncertainty as to how exactly they want to strengthen this business for the future. Jamie, what do you think this means for the succession planning at mm -hmm. Disney? Because um, that had come up over and over again, mm -hmm. and not only just from uh, Nelson Peltz, but also the other activists, Blackwells. Well, certainly, if Peltz had been able to get on the board here, it would have been really interesting to see what that would do to succession planning, as it could have definitely elevated the chances of anybody who was not currently at Disney, as one of the major points Peltz has reiterated over and over again is the uh, advantages of having an outside fresh perspective. But with Disney getting their board together, have solidifying control here, it really turns to looking at those leading internal candidates. And there's been so much speculation about who this might be, whether or not you want to prioritize someone in the entertainment division, which needs a lot of work, or the parks business, which is, as we've highlighted, an incredible big, big profit driver, or sports, which is, you know, another huge dynamic area with Disney, with the joint venture coming up, ESPN being lost in flagship. There are arguments for leaders of all these divisions taking the reins, but the big question, of course, is who is best suited to manage well, all of these together. Well, let me ask you that, Jamie. I mean, who is the best suited? I mean, I remember that, you know, what they did, right? It's always been kind of internal candidates. I remember when Jay Rizzullo was CFO and Tom Staggs was head of parks and they, you know, would switch positions so that they could learn more about the company. And with the understanding that one of these guys might be the heir apparent at some point, it didn't play out that way. But do you believe that it needs to be somebody internally or does it need to be somebody maybe from outside with a different look? Um, for the, you know, a different view maybe on the company. So at Thurbridge, what we've been hearing from the experts we speak with is really just the strength and importance of Disney's culture in determining who this is going to be and how more likely than not, they're really going to lean on some of that internal muscle that they have. And if we look at some of these leaders, there's Dana Walden and Alan Bergman over leading the entertainment division. Both could potentially be a good fit to really regalvanize that business. Josh DeMauro over at Experiences to really lead that. There are definitely some individuals with impressive track records who could come in here internally and lead this company. But of course, it's really hard to know exactly uh, how the board is going about this. They've been fairly hush-hush about who exactly is even officially in the running here. But there are definitely some people to tap internally who could be a very strong leader. But you don't company. think it should be somebody in externally then? It seems based off of what we're hearing, it is fairly unlikely huh. Disney will turn externally. But then again, um, we'll have to see what the board wants to do here. Hey, Jamie, tell, tell us, take us into the economics of streaming here. Like, why is it so hard to make Disney Plus profitable? I mean, Netflix, look, it took a long time. It took many years, but Netflix is profitable. They know how to do it. 
Yeah, Netflix is profitable. And one thing which is amazing is that they've been turning an operating profit ever since they launched streaming in 2007. <laughs> Um, which is definitely amazing and one thing that all the streaming players, Disney included, is jealous of. And there are a couple of reasons here why it's been such a big loss leader. First, it's just customer acquisition. There's been such a race to have growth at all costs to try to catch up to Netflix's scale, which at this point is looking increasingly difficult with them at 240 million, Disney around 150, 160 for their core Disney Plus offering. With that growth um, comes a lot of marketing, so many dollars spent to try to get people to come and stay. And then also the content costs. We've heard so much about how content is king, how there's been this golden age of streaming and the programming spend that it has accompanied that. That is one thing which also right now is coming to a bit of a shift over the last year or two with profitability at the forefront with the strikes some delays in content spend. Uh, that's one area which is getting a bit of an adjustment as Disney and other players try to balance the books and not sp or make sure that all their spend is rationalized. So between content, between marketing, between also just building the infrastructure for ad supported tiers, right. making sure the technology platform is there. There are a number of major costs to make this a large scaled and viable business. So Jamie, I don't know if you uh, cover Apple by any chance, but we just have a, a story by our own Mark Gurman just crossing the Bloomberg. Apple has teams investigating a push into personal robotics, a field with the potential to become one of the company's ever shifting next big things. This is according to uh, people, Tim, familiar with the situation, follows just shortly after they said we're done with the car. Right? Yeah, engineers at Apple have been exploring a mobile robot that can follow users around their homes, said the people who asked not to be identified because the Skunk Works project is private. The iPhone maker has also also developed an advanced tabletop home device that uses robotics to move a display around, they said. Yep, uh, efforts said to be in beginning stages and it's unclear if the products will ultimately be released. Shares of Apple, uh, not really necessarily moving, although they look like they're moving a little bit lower on this news, down about half a percent. Um, before we go back to Disney, Jamie, any thoughts? Do you follow Apple? Uh, I cover their media team, so if you have any question about Ted Lasso, I'm your guy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's great. All right. <laughs> well played, Jamie. Well done, well done. Um, all right, so I don't know. What's Is there a timeline that we have to give Disney at this point? Well, the thing which we really have to hold Disney to is definitely the streaming profitability goals. I mean, seeing if they can achieve that, one of the big questions is, uh, you know, about Bob Iger's return to this company, making sure he's executing on that while also seeing his CEO transition succession happen. Mm. That's key. And then also more color about uh, the long-term operating margins for streaming. They want double digits. It took Netflix a decade to get double-digit operating margins consistently. Uh, so those are definitely some things to look at and really that year timeline is gonna be key for the company. And what about the parks? They have said that they're gonna spend uh, 60 billion and revamping the park. And Universal Studio has said that they are going to have some new attractions. They have a new location in Florida where they're, uh, it's Disney's home turf. Uh, what do you think about the 60 billion? How do you think that should be spent? So what we've been hearing from our experts is that really the priority for Disney is much more on these huge immersive experiences than kind of one-off rides, think the traditional Space Mountain kind of feature. They're really trying to build these new lands which have people just uh, spend so much time in the park and drive these really engaging experiences and then also justify uh, the increasingly expensive day passes that Disney commands at its various parks. So in terms of where this will go, Disney's announced a variety of different features. If you listen to the call today, expanding different, uh, you know, massive experiences in Paris and Tokyo and their international stage. So looking at some of these large scale projects is what we're going to be keeping, you know, an ear out for for Disney to really get some clarity as. Uh, the, for them, of course, the constant story is how do we monetize their uh, hundred right. year history of IPs and their new stories. Mm -hmm. And these immersive experiences are definitely one of the areas they may look towards. Hey, Carol, you know one character you will not see uh, at Disney? What's that? At the Disney theme parks? Who? Bluey. Despite the <laughs> fact that Bluey is streamed on Disney Plus, throughout the world, except for China, New Zealand, and Australia. Not yet, Tim Stenevec. Well, they don't have the rights to it. That's they didn't, true. They didn't buy up the rights. But maybe it's just negotiations, or maybe mm, they missed the- We'll ask Devin Leonard in a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> all, I, all I know is I've been to the park, it's been a long time. Um, my daughter was younger, and I gotta say, I had a blast, and I kinda wanna go back and go to the frozen park. I've never been there. You wanna be one of the grownups <laughs> who goes without kids to Disney? Yes, There are a lot of yes. them. There are a lot of them out there.
Uh, Jamie, thank you so much. Uh, a lot of fun. Really appreciate your insight. Jamie Lumley, Senior Analyst over at Third Bridge Group, joining us in New York City. And of course, our thanks to our own Crystal C. She's Bloomberg News Deal reporter right here in our studio. This is Bloomberg. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern. Listen on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Let's get to the macro backdrop today and also market reaction. First to that macro backdrop, you've got the latest set of economic data doing little to alter bets that the Fed will deliver rate cuts this year. That included a report showing a slowdown in services, a drop also in prices to a four-year low. That was enough to halt a slide in equities. And then, Tim, you had private jobs, a reading that continued to underscore a solid labor market here in the U.S. And then in the middle of the day, at least Wall Street time, we had Fed Chair Jay Powell speaking just about two hours ago at Stanford's Business, Government, and Society Forum. Check out what he had to say. On inflation, it is too soon to say whether the recent readings represent more than just a bump. We do not expect that it will be appropriate to lower our policy rate until we have greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably down toward 2%. All right, greater confidence, inflation moving sustainably down to 2%. With more on Jay Powell's comments, the latest data, and not on him wearing a purple tie again. We're not going to talk <laughs> about that, although that was in our Bloomberg Live blog. Let's get to Bloomberg News Economics Editor Molly Smith. She's here in our New York studio. All right, Jay Powell, Molly, any new messaging? I didn't hear it. Did you guys? Not really. Okay. Well, well then I guess we were listening to the so same is it, speech. But is it good <laughs> I, I heard some new messaging about like career advice toward the end of that the speech. That was new. Which I thought yeah. was pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I if like you're looking for any of that, of Tim. Powell. That's not the mandate. No, but I mean, it's I not thought that was pretty cool. Like, you don't often hear that from Jay. Yeah, I mean, situational. Yeah. You know, he's talking at Stanford versus, you know, at the Fed meetings to, to a bunch of economic reporters who are probably staying in their career for a while. So. But it does feel like in terms of Fed speak that we are getting as of late, that maybe they're dialing back how much we might see in terms of Fed cuts. Are we, I don't know, do we get any of that from Jay, uh, from Jay Powell? I think he's still just trying to, you know, basically like hold the market at bay here and not let people get too ahead of their skis on when the Fed is going to cut and how aggressively that's going to be. I think that's still been pretty consistent with the comments we've gotten from him. You know, he's really just sticking to the language of cuts will be appropriate, quote, at some point this year. Um, saw Bostic earlier today be still a bit more specific. Still saying this year. Still saying this yes, year. Yes. Um, you know, Bostic's been a bit more specific, calling for the fourth quarter. Other people more and just... just one cut from Bostic. Right, right. And others more just generally in the second half of the year. Okay, so how do you weigh that? That against what we heard from Powell, and how do you sort of take what we're hearing from some of these other Fed speakers, but also from Jay Powell? So that's the thing where it seems like there is a bit more divergence splitting yeah. in terms of how many cuts the policymakers think will be appropriate this year. Remember that the Fed did uphold in the March summary of economic projections three cuts for this year, but that was a close call. It very easily could have been two. Mm -hmm. So there are people really on both ends of the spectrum we know now. We now know, sorry, which dot Bostics is that he's really just seeing one cut this year where others are more split between two and three. Um, the data that we keep getting, we got ADP employment today, global services, PMI, ISM services, anything interesting or just kind of supports this idea that, hey folks, as Jay Powell has said, the US economy doing okay, good. Yeah, both things on that. I mean, it, it does support that the economy is still doing well, but I think, um, you know, a really good sign from the ISM services gauge to see those services prices easing. That has been, of course, the stickiest source of inflation. We'll see how much that feeds through into the CPI and PCE measures of services inflation. But that would be a telling sign if that does come to be in the other indicators. All right. Good stuff, as always. Um, and we do see yields backing off some of their highs, some of those earlier highs uh, that we saw today. All right. Bloomberg News Economics Editor Molly Smith. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Listen live each weekday starting at 2 p.m. Eastern on Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with the Bloomberg Business app. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Well, if you're a parent of kids of a certain age, then the TV show Bluey needs no introduction. Like Tim. Yeah, you've probably <laughs> seen it. You probably love it. And you're more than happy to pay Disney Plus each month to keep those episodes streaming. As Devin Leonard writes for Bloomberg Businessweek, it's, quote, a show that's both hilarious and deeply moving in its portrayal of how children come to terms with the world by playing games and how parents can foster this by joining the fun 
no matter how wacky it becomes. Devin Leonard is a Bloomberg Businessweek senior global business writer. His story, the cover of the new issue of Bloomberg Businessweek magazine, it's available on newsstands on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com slash Businessweek. Devin, I can't tell you how delighted I was to see that Bluey got the cover treatment <laughs> I from can tell Bloomberg you. Business Week. He was Week. like off the charts. When I heard this was happening, I was like, <laughs> I cannot wait to do this. But, but give us an idea of how this story came together. You know something, uh, Ray Hermance, who's one of the editors, she asked me to do it while I was in the midst of some piece about Sean Diddy Combs and his, you know, his demise. And you know, you know it's kind of like a, you know, I was just like, yeah, sure, because I like to take assignments. I'd never heard of this show. I'd never watched the show, and um, and, and and frankly, all I knew was that it was. A, I thought it was a Disney show, which it isn't even a Disney show. It's just a sh- it's just a show they license, but. I started watching lucky it. Lucky for them. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> well not, not so lucky for them. But, but uh, um, no, I just, you know, I started watching it and really, really got into it. And then I, then I realized actually the people who were, who were, you know, who were really sort of handling the licensing and the merchandising, well, you know, it was actually BBC Studios, the commercial arm of the BBC. So I started talking to them and, you know, was I going to go to London? Was I going to go to Brisbane, Australia? Well, I wound up going to Brisbane, Australia, where I also met along with, you know, some of the top people from BBC Studios, Joe Brum, the show's creator, and also the founders of Luda Studio who produce it. So it's a whole, you know, kind of kind of a, you know, amazing thing culminating in a trip, you know, uh, last month. So, all right, shh, because you know how popular it is because you watch it a lot. And I think if my daughter was much younger, we would be watching right. it. I'm trying to how- get my kids to watch them. <laughs> hey, 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 you got to well, check this out. Well, the funny thing is it's not just appealing to kids, but talk to us about how popular it is. Well, it, I mean, it, it's it's not it's not just the most streamed kids show in the U.S. last year. It's the second most streamed show period after Suits. Amazing. And Suits has nine seasons of episodes that are about you know almost like forty two minutes long. I mean that that's the whole thing. You know, you get lots you get lots of streaming numbers for you know if you have lots of episodes. Bluey has one hundred and fifty episodes. They're only seven minutes long, and it's just just three seasons, and yet. You know, you know, people are watching more blue, than, you know, than Friends, than Gilmore Girls, than you know, NCIS. So, so I, you know, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, there's there's something going on here. You know, you know, some, something really crazy with you know, with the. It's not just kids watching it. You know, it's it's a lot of other people too. You know, what's interesting in your piece that I had no, I, there was I learned so much in the piece. I encourage everybody to read it, even if you've never heard of this show. Um, what I found fascinating was this wasn't something that was set to be a hit from the pilot. I mean, this is not following the formula of the typical kid show by any means. This is not cookie cutter. Right. Well, no, that's the, cra- that's the crazy thing. You have this guy, you know, Joe Brom, he's 46 years old. He, you know, he li- lives in Brisbane. You know, that's where he went to high school. He spent some time in, in London as an animator. He, you know, worked on some shows on the BBC. He came back to, you know, Australia, had a sort of a little animation company that he was running for a while out of his house. And he kind of missed, you know, being around a big crew. So he was sort of like, well, if I'm going to have that again, I need to create a show, create my own show, because that's probably the only way it's going to happen. So it's like, well, what's that show going to be? And he liked Peppa Pig. And, and he, but he was like, you know, I couldn't, he could, you know, he couldn't rip off Peppa Pig, you, you know, you know, and do, you know, that, that's like Peppa Pig's family are pigs and all the other families are other you know, species. <laughs> so he's like, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll make a show about dogs. You know, my, my you know, you know, you know, my, my family will be, Australian blue healers and their families we dachshunds and basset hounds and all this stuff. So then, so then he's um, he's he's home. He has two kids, who it turns out are the same ages as Bluey and Bingo, or about the same ages. Bluey and Bingo are now they've actually gotten older on the show. Bluey's seven and, and Bingo's five. They started out as six and four, but 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 so he was able to draw on his own experiences because he's home with them. You know, and he's trying to work and he's running up and down the stairs. And and anybody who's anybody who's watched the show. That's what's going on, you know, with Bandit, the show's father. And Bandit, by the way, is an, arch- is an archaeologist, you know, sort of a not a stay-at-home, <laughs> but almost a stay-at-home archaeologist, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. But uh, but it, but but it, but in any case, he he put together a pilot. The pilot, um, it, you know, he, it, it, you know, it had uh, Bandit taking Bluey to the to the playground. Bandit's playing, you know, Fruit Ninja on his phone. He pushes Bluey around the swing set. Bluey goes around the swing set, clunks him. He shows it to these guys at Ludo Studio, who he'd done some work for, and they liked it. And it was supposed to be from the, from the start. He wanted to do a show that's kind of both for grown-ups and for kids, so yeah. sort of you know with two levels of kind of humor. Even though, so, but anyway, the Ludo's guys liked it. They tried to shop it around, and people said to them, "Hey, is this Family Guy or is this Peppa Pig?" And they yeah. were kind of like both. And 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 you know and you know people just didn't get it except for one guy, Michael Carrington, who was head of children's at the ABC. In this case, 
the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. But but it's just, I mean, I just just the genesis of the show is you know is so strange because because really it was just Joe Brum you know you know missing being around a lot of other animators. Um, first of all, I've always adored you, and I love your reporting and respect. <laughs> but to hear you talk about Bluey in, in such detail, it just takes just it to a, a whole other a nice level. <laughs> difference from talking about Diddy, yeah, and I, the legal I, troubles that, that Diddy faces. <laughs> I'm like trying to think. Well, wait. The last time we talked with you, um, which is what makes you so wonderful, Devin well, Leonard. Well, um, no, it's, but it, but it's it's just such this material is just as rich, and it's kind of crazy. But. Well, speaking of rich, right? It's made a lot of money for some people. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's it, or who? It, well, it, it's well, I, it, it turns out the, the ABC basically you might you might say that they really sort of discovered the show, and 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 Michael Carrington was able to get a, a, the ABC to put some money into a pilot. They, they they he said he said I would have greenlit it you know you know on the spot, but they didn't have enough money. So, but they did give uh, you know Joe Brown and you know Ludos enough money to actually you know make a five minute pilot. Um, which BBC Studios loved, um, but as part of the deal, BBC Studios wound up with the international distribution and licensing rights. And you know, and, and the, you know, the ABC guys like, well, we don't have those kind of resources, so they might as well, they might as well, you know, you know, you know take that. But so then they're the guys that have been making making you know you know all the money. I mean, you know, Ludo Studios controls it, so mm-hmm. obviously they're making money. Joe gets a gets a percentage of the revenues, but but they're the people doing all the toy deals, okay, and, and all that. Yeah. Well, what about Disney? Well, because Tim, that's how so people that's, watch it in most of the world. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I think I said before I came into this whole thing. This is a Disney show, you know. Oh no, it's just a show they license, and in 2019, they outbid a whole lot of other, including Nickelodeon, to uh, you, you know, you know, for the, for the rights to, rights to distribute the show, i.e., you know, on their platforms, you know, on Disney Junior, you know, Disney Channel, and on Disney Plus. But what they passed up at the time, they also had 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 the chance to license the merchandising and the theme park rights, <gasps> which and they understand. That's a that's a yeah, yeah, but 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 cool. but, so, but so that's you know that's something they really regret now. Because anyway, yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, we've only got about a minute left. Season four. <laughs> is there going to be a season four? He's well, asking that, for his kids. <laughs> well, well, you, you know, there has there hasn't it hasn't been announced, and uh, you know, season three is about to culminate with this with a special episode. The sign is twenty eight minutes long, and uh, you know, people are sort of saying, oh, you know, there's going to be a season four, but but well, I, well, actually, nobody can say, say say for sure. Everyone's trying to act as if there's going to be one, but season three was greenlit in twenty twenty. I mean that's been running in Australia since 2021. Wow. So, huh. so 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 basically they wrapped see, you know they wrapped season three you know you know in like tw- around in tw- you know sometime in like 2022 maybe late 2023. So, so there's nothing else out there. And and this is when when you know the excitement about the show it, it's just you know it just keeps getting higher and higher. You know you know people are really excited excited about the sign. But but then what? And also. What's Bluey worth? Uh, you, you know, I didn't mention mention before, but but you know, Bluey's been valued. You, you know, as you know, said to be worth as much as two billion dollars. It could be worth, you know, Jeez. going forward, it could be worth as much as Peppa Pig was. It was sold to Hasbro. Yeah. You know, for for four, four billion dollars, but with three seasons, you know, I don't know. And it's just unclear. Joe Brum, who's really a creative genius, whether or not you know he wants to keep going. Interesting. Well, and when you're a balloon in the uh, Thanksgiving Day uh, Thanksgiving Day Parade, you know you're a big deal. Um. This was a gem. <laughs> uh, Devin Leonard, uh, senior global business writer for Bloomberg Business Week. It's the cover story of the new issue of Bloomberg Business Week that will be out on newsstands already online and on the Bloomberg terminal. Devin, thanks. I'm driving in my car. I turn on the radio. Yeah, how about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's going to drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. You it's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That funk to music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, well, I don't have to tell any of you what? this. Shares of NVIDIA up more than 80% so far this year. Last year, 240%. Although our next guest is optimistic about the long-term productivity potential of AI for business, Carol, he says investors need to be selective and don't get carried away 
with the momentum enthusiasts. Yeah, I believe that stock is the second best performing name in the S&P 500. And what's the first? Uh, Supermicro, right? Yeah, yeah. Another AI play. Exactly, exactly. But it hasn't been in the S&P 500 all year, so we can't really no, count that's, that. No, that's fair, but nonetheless. Yeah. But NVIDIA was the top performing name yeah. in the S&P 500 last year. Hey, so let's get to it. Let's bring in our Drive to the Close guest, Alan Lance, back with us, Director of Research at LanceGlobal.com, President of Allen B. Lance Associates, joining us once again from Toledo, Ohio. Alan, good to have you back with us. Um, talk to us nice about, time. yeah, nice to have you here. So when we talk about NVIDIA, um, what, do you think that there's more room to run or that, you know, that there's, yeah, break it down for us. Yeah, I think, you know, it's going to be winners and losers uh, differentiated much more so than last year. I think like 2023, Apple was up when they had flat earnings and 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 really it just rode that uh, wave of the AI and, and the mega, you know, uh, tech theme. But, uh, you know, this year, I think what we're seeing are, are the, the winners and losers. Uh, you know, we liked NVIDIA going into the year and we liked Amazon uh, and, and uh, Meta uh, and Google uh, Alphabet. And basically, uh, the two that we didn't like was um, Apple and, and and Tesla, and, and it's really shown just the you know the first three months of the year where Nvidia is still I think uh, cheap. I mean, I would buy really eight fifty area or, or, or under if you would if, buy it. Uh, sorry, repeat that. You'd buy it when like eight fifty. Okay. It was there uh, you know like a week or, or so ago, and, and we were nibbling on it for clients that don't own it. Uh, we we have a lot of clients that own all those and. We sold some Tesla in the 200s, and we'll probably revisit Tesla if it continues to weaken. But you know, I, I think they are dealt with the hardest hand, Tim yeah. here, and and um, you know, Apple is, is 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 the second most difficult. The one we'd probably buy of the Magnificent Seven or the former Magnificent Seven yeah. would be uh, Alphabet, just because I, I think they really botch the launch of Gemini, and I think they've got some good things to come, and they're, they're going to do probably what Meta did, and why we like Meta. Uh, and, and that's just cut back uh, expenses and, and really focus on certain areas. And, and Apple's doing that, but it's just going to take longer well, and there's more uncertainty. On that Magnificent 7, they're, you know, like we've been calling it Magnificent 4, but on the Magnificent 7, JP Morgan uh, about a month ago said Magnificent 7 stocks are cheaper versus the rest of the equity market than they were five years ago, given their latest set of earnings. And they kind of put that out. So they believe that there was more room to run. Um, Having said that, how do you kind of distinguish, Alan, between getting caught up in momentum plays and just getting caught up in that euphoria versus really kind of understanding the fundamental plays, which is what you seem to be breaking down when it comes to a name like NVIDIA? Yeah, it's really the fundamentals. I mean, NVIDIA is cheaper than it was a year ago, even though it's done so much uh, as far as an appreciation side. While you have a Tesla that's struggling and, and an Apple, you know, that hasn't shown growth and in you know uh, multiple quarters so 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 i think that that's the difference they all rode up in 23 and and now it's a matter of people looking at the fundamentals and and, and I, I think that's going to be the the key areas as far as into the future even as this ai plays out there's going to be big winners and losers and and uh you know you you want to make sure you're in the right areas everybody's going to be talking about it and saying that they have an advantage with it but you know there's it's going to be few and and far between, but uh, that that that's the the biggest difference I think is just looking at the fundamentals instead of just momentum and, and technicals. Uh, right. And, and, uh, you know, staying away from the higher risk areas. Even Nvidia, you know, if it continues to move up, you know, we'll we'll start lightening positions, especially when when it's over concentrated, which it is for some of our accounts. Hey, Alan, um, I'm curious about Apple uh, because it's down. Close to 12% so far this year. Our own uh, Mark Gurman out with a pretty cool story. I don't know if you've had a chance to read it. Not so magnificent this year, though. No, not so. No, like I said, down 12%. Um, (laughs) Apple's exploring robots as its next big thing after the car fizzles. Um, Where does Apple need to go from here for you to get to a place where you could start buying and holding again? That's a great question. I I think uh, another uh, 10% down, uh, we'd start looking at it um, again. Uh, to buy for accounts that don't don't own it, I, I still think I, I love their you know ecosystem. You know it's a, it's a great company. It's just a, a matter of there's a lot of uncertainty. They've got a lot of uh, you know headwinds with China and 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 different things that they're they're uh, trying to square away. It's kind of what we saw you know with 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 Meta. You know when when they had their their problems in in 2022, and I think Alph- Alphabet and um, 
unfortunately, Apple will have to go well, through that. And Apple, I think the headwinds are even stronger. And that's does that I'm, mean there needs to be a year of efficiency at Apple, Alan, where they lay off <laughs> nice. thousands of people nice. like Meta did? I mean, that's one way Meta yeah, got there. You know, I think Alphabet will be the first to start doing that, you know, in, in a major degree and, and, and start cutting back. But I, I, I think if, if you continue to see the results on Apple, we might even see it there. But do, does Apple need to find a new source of revenue, right? The iPhone has been, you know, such uh, an outstanding product for them, right? And still the bulk of uh, their revenues. But having said that, they scrapped, you know, after almost 10 years, the car project. We're talking about Mark Gurman and his exclusive on exploring robots as kind of the next big thing. Um, do they need to, in your view, though, find a new source of revenue? We've, I feel like we've been talking about this for Apple for a long time, and yet the Apple iPhone continues to deliver. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, and, and their service, you know, services really picked up, mm -hmm. you know, with the apps and, and that, they, you know, they, they have some, you know, regulatory, you know, issues. And, and uh, yeah, they, they do. That, that's one of the reasons we were, um, you know, negative, more negative on Apple and, and, and Tesla, just because of the uncertainty and um, you know we we can see the revenue sources with Meta. We can see it with uh, as Amazon and, and obviously Nvidia has, has come through with flying colors. But but with Apple and, and Tesla, I, I think it's difficult. They definitely need, but uh, you know it's unclear right now, and that's why you know we wouldn't chase it. Um, you know from a standpoint of buying it just because it's down from 190 to you know 169. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you know in the 140s we'd start revisiting it, and if it yeah. looked like they're starting to do the right things, you know, like I think Alphabet is, then, uh, you know, it'd be time to start accumulating in the weakness. All right, gonna leave it there. Hey, listen, thank you so much. Apple shares, by the way, folks, uh, just up about eight tenths of a percent here in today's session. And a quick check on what uh, Alphabet is up to. Uh, Alphabet is up just about two tenths of a percent, so little change there. Alan, thank you so much, really appreciate it. Alan Lance, Director of Research at LanceGlobal.com, President of Alan B. Lance and Associates, joining us once again from Toledo, Ohio. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 2 to 5 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.